Today, we're looking at the Punch Brothers cover of Church Street Blues and how they got from this in 4 4. Well, I've been hanging out of town, party in that low down rain, watching good time Charlie friends that's driving me insane. To this in 5 8. I've been hanging out of town, Lord, in that low down rain, watching good time Charlie friends is driving me insane. We're looking at five ways to convert from common meter to complex meter. Welcome to Score Study. Now, the first thing that I noticed when I listened to this for the first time was how the meter is used. We're in 5-8 here, and I know that we're in 5 because I'm really good at listening. One, two, three, four, five, two, two, three, four, five. But this doesn't sound like a typical 5-8. Five, 5-8 eight. Five, eight is typically subdivided into groups of 2 plus 3 or 3 plus 2, which gives it that asymmetrical off-balance feel. That's because they are employing something here known as a hypermeter, which is when an entire measure feels like a single beat. One of my favorite examples of the hypermeter is Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the second movement. It's in three, but it's felt in four, with every measure of three feeling like a single beat. So in Church Street Blues, that would be a measure of five beats that are moving so fast that it feels like a single beat, almost like the quarter is 55 beats per minute. Another way that we could think about it is the beat is subdivided into five instead of into four. I've been hanging out of town, Lord, in that low down rain. Watching good time, Charlie Friends is driving me insane. All right, so let's look at a side-by-side -side comparison of the two scores. Over here to the left, we have the Tony Rice version, and over to the right, we have the Punch Brothers version. And you'll notice that it's about a two to one measure ratio. So for every two measures of the Punch Brothers version, we have one measure of the Tony Rice version. Uh, that is helped out by the fact that every so often there's a two four measure in the Tony Rice, but that's not, that really doesn't have a ton of bearing. And I noticed kind of right off the bat that the strong beats have got the same words. So if you look at the downbeats of the Tony Rice version, I've been in that watching, driving. Those are the downbeats in the Tony Rice version, and those are all on downbeats in the Punch Brothers version as well. So in measures one, three, five, and seven in that particular case. But then of course in 4-4 we have a secondary strong beat, and that would be beat three, and that is what takes up the downbeats of measures two, four, six, and eight in the Punch Brothers version. So if you're looking to do this sort of uh, conversion from, from common meter to a complex meter, then make sure that the strong beats have got the same words. It's hard to make a one-to-one -one rhythmic comparison because of how much sliding occurs, and so that, that gets into how much precision should you notate the vocal score with. But it appears that there's a use of an equivalent rhythm, which that would be tip number three, is to use an equivalent rhythm. So that 16th dotted eighth figure in the Tony Rice version often becomes a, an eighth quarter figure in the Punch Brothers version. And that is a really good idea. So that's tip number three, use an equivalent rhythm. And so that eighth quarter figure mimics the, the 16th dotted eighth figure. But at the same time, we have the, the words that are matching up on the strong beats, we also have quite a bit of blurring of the beat as well. You'll notice in both versions, there's a number of, of scoops and slides and grace notes that are notated in the score. Uh, and that, that serves to blur the, the beat. Let's listen to the, the vocals isolated. I've been hanging out of town, low in that low down rain. Watching good time, Charlie Friends is driving me insane. Up on shady Charlotte Street, both green lights look red. I wish I was back home on the farm, boys, my feather bed. Of course, there always comes the question, how rigidly do you notate a vocalist vocal take? And it's on a spectrum from what they actually did very precisely to 
what makes more sense notationally. I tend to stick somewhere in the middle so that you can see some of the ornamentation, but it's probably not exactly what they sang. So here are my notes for the rhythmic dictation of this. This was quite a challenge, perhaps maybe the, the hardest rhythm that I've ever written down in my life. But everything that I've got circled in blue represents a time where the the consonant was on the beat, but the vowel, the rest of the word was delayed by either a half beat or a whole beat. And that really serves to blur the beat as a whole because you don't really know where that word falls. Watching good time, Charlie Friends is driving me insane. Up on Shady Charlotte Street. And then I noticed a similar thing going on with the fiddle solo. So let's take a listen to that. So I found this masterclass of the Punch Brothers talking about how they place rhythms in relation to the beat. But that particular masterclass is about an hour and 15 minutes long and none of the clips really fit well in this video. So I'm including a link in the description to that entire masterclass called How to Play with Others. It's very fascinating. So if you want to watch that, it's in the description below. So tip number four would be to blur the beat, but to certainly balance that out with making sure that the, the listener stays grounded. And that seems like a fine line to walk. As I've been listening to this over and over, I feel like texture rolls play a big part in, uh, in the overall feel of this. I mean, perhaps that, that statement seems a little bit too obvious, but I, I do feel like the role that each instrument is playing really helps to build a convincing 5-8 and still make it sound like it's it's almost in common time. So what I mean by that is that the mandolin, the banjo, and the acoustic guitar are all pretty locked into that 5-8 groove. The mandolin and the acoustic guitar are playing every beat, and the banjo is playing straight 16th notes. And then you have the bass, which is accenting the beat. It never plays anything faster than 8th notes. The melody is a, a contrast to that 5-8 groove, adding some syncopation and some color. And then you have the fiddle, which plays the longest notes, and that makes sense because it's got a bow. But like we just talked about, it also blurs the beat, which provides another contrast to that strict 5-8 groove. Side note here, this is actually really great idiomatic orchestration. All six parts play to their strengths, which may sound like a very obvious thing to do, but what this does is it creates a very convincing and rich texture. And now that I think about it, this is very similar to what they do in movement and location uh, in terms of texture rules. That one is actually more of a polymeter between the banjo's groups of three and everyone else's groups of four, but I digress. One other thing that I would like to mention is that verse three is actually in 5-4. Again, 5-4 is usually divided into subgroups of three plus two or two plus three. But much like their 5-8 verses, there's no real beat preference here. It sounds pretty much more like a standard bluegrass groove, but just with an extra beat. Wish I had some guitar strings like diamond brand. I'd string up this Martin box and go and join some band. And I, I think that further goes to bridge the gap between 5-8 and 5-4. It's a bit of a nod to the original and to bluegrass as a whole, but then you still have the, the fresh take, uh, the innovative uh, complex meter in 5.4. So one of the reasons that I wanted to make the score study series in the first place was to make myself study more scores. My job as both a composer and a theorist requires a lot of that, and I felt like I was out of practice. But another reason that I had wanted to start the series is because I realized that I was never really taught how to study scores despite that being such a big part of my education. 
Typically, it was to reinforce some theoretical concept that we were learning in theory class, but it was never really like, this is how you open up a score and analyze it. So today I'm introducing the score study field guide. It's my step-by-step -step process for how to study scores, for how to analyze music on your own. You can see this particular method modeled in the score study videos we've done so far, as I've been loosely following that step-by-step -step guide. It's got a simple six step process for analyzing music all the way from selecting a piece of music to analyze all the way through the analysis process and a number of exercises to help you get through the process, but then also parsing your results. What do you do with when you're done and how do you know what it means? And if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, I've got the score study field guide available for absolutely free on my website. Just click the link in the description below. And like I said, I typically follow something near that process for a score study video. So for the next one, if you have the score study field guide, you'll be able to follow along. Hopefully y'all have been enjoying the score study series so far, and if you have, please let me know in the comments below what piece you would like to see me analyze next. I'll see you next time.